Well, today we are going to begin a new book, going back to the Old Testament. What, no woo-hoos, no, no fist bumps, no excitement? We're, g- <laughs> We're going to start the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. All right, so when we finished Exodus, so the order is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. When we finished Exodus, God had delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. He'd led them out into the wilderness to Mount Sinai, and he really began the process of establishing them as a nation. And so we remember that one of the things God did was he gave them the law. He revealed the Ten Commandments to Moses, but more than that, we read many of those laws in Exodus. And God also gave instructions for the building of uh, what's called the tabernacle. This, uh, in our text today, it'll be called the tabernacle of meeting. It was the place where God would meet with his people. It was the worship tent. And the Ark of the Covenant would be in the most holy place. And then the, the outside of that would be the other uh, furniture, the altar of incense and the, the table of showbread and the lampstand. And, and all the worship of Israel would be conducted there as a part of the, in the tabernacle. And in the outer court, the, the, the altar for the burnt offerings. And so we saw all the detail given of the tabernacle as we ended the book of Exodus, and they built the tabernacle. And we were told that it was a reflection, the tabernacle and its elements and its layout, it's actually a reflection, a picture of the heavenly throne room and how God is worshiped in heaven. And so now as we get into Leviticus, we're going to get specific instructions on how to worship. And we're going to begin in these first few chapters, we're going to cover chapters one through four this morning. Uh, about the specific sacrifices, different types of sacrifices that were to be offered. Now, the idea of offering a sacrifice for worship was not new when, when Moses received these instructions from the Lord. We read about sacrifice for worship all the way back in the earliest chapters of the book of Genesis. Remember that Cain and Abel brought gifts to worship God. And God accepted Abel's gift because he offered a good gift, one according to uh, the way God had instructed them to worship. And that was he offered something from his flock. He offered an animal sacrifice. And even before that, in the Garden of Eden, when God uh, came to Adam and Eve because they sinned, remember that Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves. They felt shame for their nakedness after sin. And they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Ouch. Um, you ever know if, if you ever met a fig leaf, you know what I'm talking about. But God provided a covering for them, and He provided this text says He provided skins. Well, the inference there is that that skin came from an animal. There was an animal sacrifice to cover their sin. So this idea of worship and covering of sin by animal sacrifice goes all the way to the beginning. But now God is going to give His people Israel as He establishes them as a nation a very specific set of instructions about how they are to worship through sacrifice. So there are three points I want to make before we dive into the text very quickly. First, we want to understand that real worship always has to fit what God says is acceptable. We don't just worship God any way we want. True worship, acceptable worship, real worship is worship according to God's plan. What God says is acceptable is acceptable. We want to worship uh, according to his way. And that makes sense because worship is not just appeasing God. The idea of worship is not just to give something to God that makes him happy. Worship is ultimately about conforming ourselves to his ways, about surrender of ourselves. So that obviously begins in that, that our forms of worship would fit the forms that he instructs. So that's the first thing. The second thing, the sacrifices that God gives through Moses, they will, there are many of them. We're going to look at uh, four specific ones today. But they all show different aspects of the perfect sacrifice that would later be made by Jesus himself. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. He came to be a sacrifice, right? And so in the Old Testament sacrifices, 
it's going to be instructive for us. It's going to show us different aspects, different pictures, different parts of the complete and total perfect sacrifice of Christ. It's amazing to think Hebrews says that Jesus offered himself once for all sin for all time. We're going to see that God is going to institute an entire system of sacrifices in order to prepare people and instruct them for the incredible work that Jesus would do in just one offering. It would take not only um, thousands and thousands and thousands of animal sacrifices to temporarily cover sin before the Messiah would come, but it would take many different types of sacrifices to cover sin and provide God's grace for his people. And yet all of that, the many different types and the many repetitions are all covered in the one sacrifice of Jesus. And so we'll learn about the details of that as we go through these sacrifices. And then thirdly, the details and regulations of these Old Testament sacrifices, they also help us understand what is important to God in worship. And this will apply to us, our New Testament life. Do you ever roll into church on a Sunday and think, I wonder if God's happy with this. I wonder if what we're doing is really acceptable to him. You know, we don't come to worship just to feel good. That's a blessing. It's a byproduct. But we come to honor God. That's what worship is. It's not just, I I hope the sermon's good, and I hope the snacks are good, and I hope the coffee's decent, you know. We try to have good sermons and snacks and coffee. And we enjoy being blessed and blessing each other. But the real reason we come is to present ourselves to the Lord, to honor him, to worship him. And so how do we know if what we do, not just here, but every day in life, is it acceptable to him? Does he receive it? Is it worth anything? What we learn about what God values as we look at these Old Testament sacrifices and his instructions to Israel about worship. Listen to this verse, Romans 12:1. The Apostle Paul writes to us and says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's Paul's way of saying our whole life as believers is an act of worship toward the Lord, living sacrifices. So we learn about that New Testament life even through these Old Testament instructions. All right. So let's dive in this morning. Chapter 1, Leviticus 1.1. 1, 1. I can't wait for you to go talk to your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers this week and be like, we started Leviticus on Sunday, and it was awesome. Okay. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting. That's the tabernacle we talked about. Saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord... You shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd and of the flock. So the livestock means when you bring an animal for sacrifice, you can't go out into the woods and shoot a wild animal. You have to bring a domesticated animal, one that you own. And the idea here is that worship is going to cost you something. That's important. And it can be of the herd or of the flock, which means it can be cattle, it can be a bull, or it can be of the flock. It can be a goat or a lamb. Okay, so those are the animal sacrifices. Verse 3, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. So the first type of offering that's talked about is the burnt offering. You're like, my wife gave me a burnt offering last night. and (laughs) Dinner got overcooked. Thank you for treating me like deity, baby. That's not what it's talking about. Not my wife. I was somebody else's wife. My wife never burns anything. Ever. The burnt sacrifice. Now, now we're going to spend a little bit of time, most time, on this sacrifice because because the elements here will help us unpack the rest of them. We get the most detail here. Okay? So if if the offering is a burnt sacrifice to the Lord. All right. The idea about the burnt offering, it is completely consumed in the fire. When you offer a burnt offering, the entire animal is given. Every part of it. That won't be the case in all of the offerings, but in this one, it's total. It has to be a male without blemish. 
That is, the male, because the males were considered to be of higher value, was a higher economic value, so you want to give your best, the most valuable thing to the Lord. And without blemish, so the highest possible quality. And then, of course, you have to do this of your own free will, if he shall offer it of his own free will. God doesn't want forced sacrifice. He doesn't want forced worship. He, God always invites us into a relationship. He always invites us into obedience. You're here because you choose to be here. We're with the Lord because we choose. That's the basis of love, freedom of choice. God didn't have to love us. He chose to love us, and we don't have to love him, but we get to choose to love him. So, so worship is of our, of our will, of our free will. And, and so we see these different elements in the sacrifice. Now look at verse 4. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So the main aspect of the burnt offering is that it was to make atonement, or it was a payment, or technically speaking in the Old Testament, a covering for sin. And the idea of putting your hand on the head of the animal, so you'd bring it up to the priest, and you put your hand on the animal, and you would say, this is for me. And the idea is you're identifying with the animal, and an idea you're transferring your guilt and your sin into the animal so it can be a substitute in your place. You are the reason the animal is going to die. That's the idea. Now verse 5. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priests among Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So here the, bring, the person bringing the sacrifice is the one who does the killing. You didn't just drop off your animal to the priest and let him do all the work. No, you put your hand on the animal and then you struck the blow. You cut the jugular vein. You killed the animal. Not only is worship to be a choice, but listen, and this sounds obvious, but it's important. Worship is to be done by the worshiper. Like other people can't worship for you. Worship is always personal. Here the sacrifice is made by the individual. And the blood of the animal is spilled out. And then some of that blood is sprinkled on the altar itself. Why? Listen later in chapter 17 of this book. We're going to read this. It says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. The blood is associated with the life of the animal. The blood of a part, you lose your blood, you lose your life. Right? The blood is essential. It represents the very life of the animal. And so it is the blood, the life of the animal that makes atonement. What is, what's the wage of sin, according to Romans? The wages of sin is death. Right? So, so the death of the animal atones for the sin. Life has to be given. Now what else happens to the sacrifice? Verse 6, And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. And then the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head, the fat, in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice." an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. So the priest would build the fire, and they would lay the animal parts on the altar to burn. But the animal was, was killed and prepared by the worshiper, including cutting it up into pieces and washing the pieces as, they, as needed. And so the sacrifice was to be a clean sacrifice. Now, if, if his offering is of the flocks, so that was for a bull, Right? Now, you can also do the same offering, but from the flock. So a sheep or a goat, as a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. Again, we said the male was of greater economic value. Thus, it was to be the sacrifice and without blemish. Perfect. A perfect specimen. Worship is about giving God our best. 
Worship is about giving God our best. You know, whenever there's like a canned food drive uh, somewhere, and, and you're like, hey, bring canned goods, you know, we're going to help those who are less fortunate. There's always that person who brings expired beets. A can of expired, are they bringing their best? No, they're cleaning out their pantry. We should not be that way in worship. We should not be cleaning out the pantry. We should be bringing God our best. Go buy something new. Name, brand, end date. Bring that if you're going to be a blessing. Right? But that's the principle, to bring the best. Listen, in a very important way. Isn't that how God loved us? Didn't he give us his best? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Listen to the words of 1 Peter chapter 1. This is verse 18 and 19. Peter says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus fulfills for us the place of the burnt offering. The perfect male specimen without blemish, given wholly and completely to atone for our sin. So we get a few more instructions now. Verse 11 about the lamb. He shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's sons shall sprinkle its blood all around on the altar. And he shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and the legs with water, and then the priest shall bring it and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. So just with a so just as with a calf or a bull, a goat or sheep is to be prepared and offered in the same way. Notice the repetition of that phrase, a sweet aroma to the Lord. The idea is that the offering given according to God's instructions is acceptable and pleasing to him. He receives it, a sweet aroma. I just always think about driving by my favorite barbecue restaurant. That's what it is. Meat cooked on the fire. It's a sweet aroma to the Lord. Verse 14, And if the burnt sacrifice of his offering to the Lord is of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. So you can do cattle, you can do sheep or goats, and now the text says you can offer a bird. Now these animals are all of different monetary value, but the law was given so that any person of any means could come and offer a burnt offering to the Lord. If you couldn't afford a, a bull, you could afford a a goat or a lamb. If you couldn't afford one of those, you could afford um, the birds. So worship was available to all. The, the priest shall bring it to the altar, wring off its head, and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out, of the side, out at the side of the altar, and he shall remove its crop with its feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east side into the place for ashes." So the whole bird is burned, but the crop and the feathers are, are cast aside. The east side, the idea there is it's the farthest away. That's the place farthest away <coughs> from the holy of holies, from the presence of God. All right, then he shall split it at its wings, verse 17, but shall not divide it completely. And the priest shall burn it on the altar, on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. So the bird's not cut in pieces, but it is prepared, and the whole thing is offered. Nothing is spared. And this is the last little detail we want to touch on about the burnt sacrifice, the burnt offering. It is unique in that the entirety of the animal, the entirety of the sacrifice is consumed in the fire. No part is given to the priest. No part goes back to the worshiper. Those things will happen with other sacrifices. But in this case, it is all given. And this really speaks of, uh, I think, our dedication to the Lord. You know, God is not interested 
and people who worship a little bit. God is not interested in people who worship occasionally. God is interested in calling sinners into redemption so that he might be in a relationship with them, that they might be joined together, as we talked about on Wednesday night in 1 Timothy, part of the family of God. That we have a new identity in Christ. It's a total transformation. Jesus is not something that you add to your life. He is our life. Our life is hidden with Christ in God, the Scripture says. That's where, is that what you're interested in? Because that's what the Lord is interested in. And he desires all of us. And he'll take the good parts and the ugly parts and the, none of it bothers him. But, but, but we give ourselves wholly. It's a full commitment. Do you know there's peace and full commitment? That, that's what makes marriage work. When you give yourself fully with no reservations. Couples who only put one foot in the boat, they always got a separate bank account. They, 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 they foster other friendships that, that are not really healthy. They, they're always wondering if they need to get out. Is this going to work? That's not commitment. There's no peace there. There's always tension. There's always stress. There's always turmoil. Some people are like that in the faith. Well, I'll follow Jesus as long as he doesn't let me down. But listen, there's always going to be tension. That's not redemption. Redemption is a total giving over of yourself, a full commitment. But then, but then the beauty is your whole heart is in. Everything you have, you can rest in peace. You can go for it. You don't have to hold anything back. And there's power in that commitment, but there's peace in that commitment. There's joy in that commitment. Totally giving ourselves. That's the burnt offering. Total consecration toward God. All right, chapter 2. Now, when anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of the flour, of fine flour, excuse me, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense in it. So the burnt offerings were animal sacrifices. Now we have instructions for grain offerings. Grain offerings accompanied burnt offerings. All right, they went together. And it's to offer God a portion of what was produced in the field. And, and the idea here is about acknowledging God through our work. A grain offering was a way to give thanks for God's blessing and provision in their life. Interestingly, grain offerings can be separated in many forms. Fine flour, you can offer just the meal. You can make cakes, wafers, you can, you can cook it. Um, uh, but it always has to be with oil and frankincense. These two elements go with the grain offering all the time, oil and frankincense. Oil in Scripture represents the Holy Spirit, His blessing, His presence, His empowering. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts in Zechariah 4, 6. And the prophet sees that picture of the two olive trees dripping their oil, the continual empowering and blessing of God there. And so every work that we do, all the things we produce, or accomplished, they are done in cooperation with God. It's always a result of His Spirit at work in us, His ability, His blessing. And so the grain offering was an acknowledgement of that and of giving thanks for that. And then the frankincense, what was that about? Well, first of all, it just smelled amazing. It was the most beautiful fragrance. And the idea is here, it speaks both of reverence, but also of joy. I mean, we're thanking God. This is a happy occasion. He's blessed us. And we're joyful, and, it's a, and, and, and we're recognizing his beauty. And so, oil and frankincense. Now, verse 2. This offering, he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, one of whom shall take from it his handful of fine flour and oil with all the frankincense. And the priest shall burn it as a memorial on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And note, again, notice it's fine flour. That means it's sifted flour. It's something prepared. Again, the best kind of flour that you could offer. We are to give God our best each day, right? Our best work, our best effort. And, and, and he just takes a portion of it, a memorial portion. He didn't, the priest didn't take all of the grain offering and give it to the Lord. He took a little handful of it and offered it to the Lord. The rest of that offering actually is going to go to the priest. It's part of, their, um, part of how they uh, make their living. 
That's how God provided for them in the sacrificial system um, that, that went to the priests to support them and their families. Actually, verse 3, the rest of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is most holy to the, uh, of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. Verse 4, and if you bring an offering as a grain offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour, mixed with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. But if your offering is of a grain uh, offering baked in a pan, it shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. So you could bake it, you could cook it on a pan, you could fry it. Some, some commentaries say these, some of these offerings look like donuts. But, um, but they were to be unleavened, always unleavened. What's the deal with leaven? Well, leaven is the, that's the, what we would call the baking soda or the baking powder. It's the, the, the agent that puffs up the bread, right? How it works is it actually corrupts the dough. And so in Scripture, leaven becomes a type of sin, a picture of evil that is corrupting. <clears throat> and God wants purity in worship. He wants purity in worship. He doesn't want sin mixed with worship. He, he, he wants us to, to worship in a pure way. And so, you know, in the Passover festival that we read about in Egypt, they had to get the leaven out of their houses. That was the instruction. Get rid of the sin. There should be purity. So in these sacrifices, no leaven, unleavened bread, God wants a life of pure worship from us. And we see that even in the New Testament. You know, that we read that Romans 12 verse that talks about being living sacrifices to God. Listen to what it says in Romans 12 uh, verse 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right? We're to be pure. Not to be like the world, set apart, different, so unleavened. Real worship, as we said, is not just acts of service. It's following the Lord so that we are being made to look more like him. It's, it's an inward, or results in an inward transformation. Okay, verse 7. If your offering is a grain offering baked in a covered pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. You shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord, and when it's presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. The priest shall take from the grain offering a memorial portion, burn it on the altar. It's an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. <coughs> Isn't it amazing that as human beings, we have the capacity to bring joy to the heart of God? We can do things that are a sweet aroma to him pleasing in his sight just by doing things according to the way that, that he's instructed us. Offering our life to him, offering our best to him. Verse 10, and what is left of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is most holy to the offerings of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. So no leaven, we talked about that, but also no honey. I suppose nothing artificially sweet. I, we might say it this way. God doesn't want worship from corrupt people who just pretty themselves up and act sweet on Sunday. Right? He wants real purity. Verse 12. As for the offering of the first fruits, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet aroma. So there's a type of grain offering that is called the first fruits offering. And when it's the first fruits grain offering, you don't actually burn it on the altar. You bring it, but you don't burn it. Now the first fruits, those are the, um, that's what's harvested at the very beginning of the season. That's the first thing to come out of the field and that was to be offered to God. So we honor God when we give him our best, but we also honor God when we give him what is first. And you got to think, if you're in an agrarian culture, an agrarian society, that's an act of faith to give God what's first, right? Because you don't know if a hailstorm is going to show up and ruin the rest of your crop. You don't know what's going to happen. 
But the first that comes in, you say, okay, Lord, the first belongs to you. The best belongs to you. And it's a, an act of faith and an act of worship toward him. All right, verse 13. And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So finally now, all the grain offerings have to include a little bit of salt. Why salt? What's that about? Well, salt was valuable in the ancient world. It preserved food, and so it was associated with purity. It added flavor, so it was associated with good things. It could be stored for a long time, and so it was associated with endurance or longevity. In Numbers and in Second Chronicles, God actually describes his promises to his people as a covenant of salt, which lasts forever. So there's really this idea of enduring goodness. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus speaks of salt. Mark 9, verses 49 and 50. <clears throat> Jesus says, For everyone will be seasoned with fire. That is, every, every life will, will be judged, right? And every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. So every, everything that survives the fire or that is appropriate and found to be good will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, Jesus says, verse 50, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. So if the leaven is the bad that must be removed or kept out of the sacrifice, Salt is the good which is always necessary. Salt is purity. Salt is sincerity and the enduring goodness of obedience. You know, God doesn't want just sin avoiders. Well, I avoided sin this week, Lord. <laughs> I dodged all the bullets, right? That's not our relationship with God. You know, God wants goodness. Again, to be conformed into his image. He wants us to be filled with his goodness, filled with his spirit. I believe the salt in the sacrifice is indicative of that. All right, chapter 2, verse 14. If you offer a grain offering of your first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits green heads of grain roasted on the fire, grain beaten from full heads. You shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial portion, part of the beaten grain and part of its oil, with all the frankincense as an offering made by fire to the Lord. So we see that Jesus now... He also fulfills the picture of the grain offering, especially the grain offering in the sense of the first fruits. We understand he fulfilled the burnt offering, but also this one. Where does that happen? Well, listen, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. As Paul talks about the resurrection, he refers to Jesus as the first fruits. Thinking of this sacrifice, Jesus is the first, he was the first one to be resurrected. Do you know that 1 John chapter 3 says <clears throat> that we don't know what we will be like when we're resurrected, but we know we'll be like him? We're going to be resurrected in a new body just like the body of Jesus? You know, he like went through walls and showed up in strange places and He's the first fruits. He's the first fruits. So the first fruits, they were given to the Lord with an expectation of more to come. The rest of the harvest. Jesus was resurrected, and the expectation is there are more to come. There are more to be resurrected. And that's you and I, all who believe in him. So Jesus fulfills the picture of the grain offering, the first fruits. All right, chapter 3. We're doing good. <clears throat> Another kind of offering here. When his offering is a sacrifice of a peace offering, if he offers it of the herd, whether male or female, that's a cattle again, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Again, the offerer doing the killing. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. Then he shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, 
the two kidneys and the fat that is on the priest and part of So the peace offering is about really fellowship. It's sharing or eating a meal in God's presence. You could share something with him. And the Eastern idea of sharing a meal is the very strong. Through sacrifice, God has made it possible for his people to enjoy his presence in their life. God is not just distant. He is not just up there. He is not just beyond and above. He is present in the lives of his people. And in the New Testament sense, literally presence in which God places his Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, indwells believers. Paul says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is pictured for us. And so the fat goes to him. And then, of course, we get this prohibition against eating blood because the life is in the blood. And so here, don't, you're not supposed to eat the fat or the blood. Both of those go to the Lord. Isn't it interesting that what's given to the Lord was not really good for the person? Both the fat and the blood carried health risks, so just in a practical way, right? But those were to be given to the Lord, and then the, the person gets what's really good for them, the meat of the animal, Worshiping God his way is always what's best for us. I just love that. But this, this peace offering, <clears throat> Jesus fulfills that picture for us as well. Look at chapter 4 now. So the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, and this is the last one we'll do today, saying, Speak all sin must be addressed through sacrifice. And so this is the sin offering or the purification offering. And there are different offerings for different classes of people. This is really interesting. We'll explain that in a minute. The first is we start with the high priest himself. Verse 3. If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. And then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. So he's outside the tent and he kills the animal. And now he walks inside the tent with some of the animal's blood. So into the holy place. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. So he goes right up to the Holy of Holies, and it's covered by that veil. Behind the veil is the Ark of the Covenant, and he sprinkles blood on that veil. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. So he turns around. The incense altar, which represents the prayers of God's people, He puts a little blood on the corners of that altar, uh, which is in the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar of the burnt offering. So he goes outside, back to the there in the base of it, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. If the priest sins, the idea is that his sin has polluted the tabernacle. And the blood of the sacrifice is sprinkled on the veil and on the altars and poured at the base of the... It has polluted the tabernacle and God is holy. God is holy. Did we talk about this yet? Why are we burning things? Why is there fire in the altar? What is this process about? Listen, that fire represents the holy nature of God. God is perfect and he is pure and nothing tainted, nothing sinful, nothing evil, nothing contrary is going to stand in his presence. It's going to be consumed. In fact, the scriptures in at least two places refer to God as a consuming fire. Our God, Hebrews says, our God is a consuming fire. It's the, it's the holy nature of God and wrath against sin. And that sin meets God's wrath and is consumed. 
But now this place of worship and, and, and the, the, the people in the place have been polluted by sin, and so they must be cleansed. So that God in his holiness can still dwell in the presence of men. Men can still dwell in the holy presence of God. Because sin pollutes, and that has to be cleansed. It has to be purified. And so that's why the blood is sprinkled. Now, look at verse 8. He shall take from it all the fat of the bull as the sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails, the fat which is on the entrails, the two kidneys, the fat all of the sacrifice of peace offering, and the priest shall burn them on the altar of the burnt offering. So just like the fat from the peace offering went to the Lord, the fat of this sin offering or purification offering also gets offered to the Lord. Now, verse 11, But the bull's hide and all its flesh, with its head and legs, its entrails and offal, the whole bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn it uh, on wood with fire. Where the ashes are poured out shall it be burned. So the ash heap outside the camp when they take all the ashes from the tabernacle, they're going to go burn the rest of the bull out there. We'll explain that in a minute. Now, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally. So that was the process for the priest. The high priest, if he committed some offense or sin, it required a bull, it required this process, the sprinkling of the blood all the way to the most holy place, the articles of the temple, the burning of the carcass outside the camp. Now, a similar but, uh, procedure, if the whole congregation of Israel sins, and the idea here is the leadership, if the, if the congregation of the leaders sins, again, a bull must be offered, and it's going to be the same thing. So we're not going to read that procedure. But go down to verse 22. Now, when a ruler has sinned and done something unintentional against any of the commandments of the Lord his God in anything which should not be done and is guilty, of his sin which he has committed, comes to his knowledge. He shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. So this detail tells us that uh, a single ruler, so not the whole congregation of the elders, but just a single ruler, instead of bringing a bull like the high priest does or like the rulers do, a single person just has to bring a kid of the goats without blemish. Uh, It is a sin offering. Verse 25, the priest shall take some of the blood on his finger. He puts it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pours its blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. So he doesn't have to go inside the holy place and put blood on the veil and on the incense altar. He just puts blood on the corners of the regular altar outside. Okay, still applied, but in a different way. Verse 25, and he shall burn all its fat on the altar, just like before, make atonement. All right, now look at verse 27. If any of the common people, so we've had the high priest, we've had all the rulers, we've had a single ruler, now a common person. If any of the common people sins unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done and is guilty, or if the sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering as a kid of the goats a lesser animal, a female without blemish for his sin, which he has committed. So we see the the pollution caused by sin in our life is relative to our position. Listen. Our sin affects other people. That's the first thing. Our sin we're being practical. An angry father or a bitter in the hearts of God's people. His sin doesn't just affect a corrupt boss who mismanages his business and the company suffers. It affects the employees. They lose pay. They lose their jobs. They, right, sin pollutes. It damages those around us. And the greater the responsibility, the greater the position, the greater the pollution of sin. Sin is not something light. Sin is not something that's just dismissed. It has consequence. It has effect. It affects others. But listen, God does offer forgiveness. And not only that, he offers cleansing. Go down to verse 35. 
So the priest shall make atonement for his sin that he has committed, and it shall be forgiven him. It shall be forgiven him. Now look, finishing up. We've seen how Jesus fulfilled the pictures of the other sacrifices, right? But what about the sin offering or the purification offering? This is so powerful. Listen, it says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he, that is Jesus, entered the most holy place once for all, not the most holy place of the tabernacle or the temple on earth. He entered the most holy place in heaven, right? With his own blood. He did it once for all, having obtained for sprinkling the unclean. There's the sprinkling. Remember in this sacrifice, they were sprinkling everything to cleanse it. If that's sprinkling the unclean, if it sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh or natural things, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What pollution has sin left in you? What, what pollution has sin left in your family? What pollution has what pollution has sin left? Well, listen, the precious blood of Christ sprinkled on our behalf brings cleansing forever. A clean conscience, a clean heart, a clean mind. This speaks not just of absolution before God, it speaks of healing transformation, wholeness, real purity. It brings cleansing, eternal cleansing, the text says, forever. Jesus' sacrifice frees us and cleanses us in relationship and service to him. Jesus is our purification offering. Cleansing the pollution of sin. And listen, I gotta, I gotta stick this in at the end. <clears throat> Do you remember that detail about how the bull, Jesus is our high priest. Do you remember how the bull was, the body of the bull was taken outside the camp and burned? Listen to this, Hebrews 13. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the gate. It fulfills all these pictures and, more importantly, all these purposes of sacrifice. When we say Jesus died for me, what does that mean? It means so much more than we than we than we're aware of. In fact, God had to give us all these different pictures of different types of sacrifices to even begin to describe and communicate to us the tremendous work of redemption that Jesus has done on our behalf. The burnt offering, the spotless lamb who atones for our sin. He satisfies the judgment of God. He is the grain offering the first fruits of the resurrection offered to God in anticipation of the resurrection to come. He is the peace offering. Jesus gave himself that we might be able to receive him, take him in, and have real communion and fellowship and relationship with God, a connection by the Spirit. And he is the sin offering or purification offering. He sprinkles his blood over our lives to cleanse us, to heal us, from the effects and the pollution of sin. Hallelujah. How much do we have to celebrate today in communion? So let's do it. uh, Beth, would you come? If the ushers would serve the elements, let's worship. And of course, hold on to your elements and we will pray together and receive them together in a few moments.